Thank you, Mr. President, for the introduction. Thank you, the jury, for attending to this defense. And thank you, the audience, for being here to my PhD defense. In this PhD, we focus on navigation in virtual environments, and in particular, how users can be influenced during navigation in virtual reality compared to navigation in real environments. So the context of the PhD was regarding virtual reality, and in particular, virtual environments that enables new possibilities for human exploration. The desire of navigating in virtual environments remains one of the key elements of VR technology. But the way we explore virtual environments and in VR differs from the way that we do in real life, since additional hardware or software solutions are required. Then, our approach to improve navigation in virtual environments was to consider locomotion in real environments, and in party walking, that is the most common locomotion techniques used in our daily lives. In order to explore safely environments, we have to interact with our surroundings environment through a perception action loop. Gibson, the founder of the ecological theory of visual perception, stated that there is a strong coupling between humans and their environment. In particular, he mentioned that we perceive in order to move, but we also move in order to perceive. As you can see in the video, this loop enables the perception of sensory information, like the optical flow or the surrounding elements of the environment, such as the rocks, in order to make actions, here walking safely, based on what is perceived. This is how humans can achieve exploration in real environments. But how is this loop when humans are exploring virtual environments? On the video, you can see a user interacting with a virtual reality system. He is immersed in the virtual environment, and he's interacting with this environment thanks to interaction devices such as a head-mounted display to see the virtual environment, controllers to select or manipulate subject. <coughs> But he's also navigating to a plat uh, thanks to a platform that enables him to move and explore this virtual environment. Then, the way that he perceives and interacts with this environment differs from what he would do in a real environment, and then the perception action loop is modified. To improve locomotion techniques in VR, and in particular the locomotion techniques, that was the objective that we were focusing. We focused on steering techniques as they provide continuous virtual motion as in real walking, and they don't require large workspace for tracking the users. To reach this objective, we try to understand the difference between locomotion in real environments and virtual environments by following a multidisciplinary approach combining computer science, human movement science, and perception. The main challenge that, of this thesis was then to understand how the locomotion techniques influence users' behavior in VR, and in particular, why using steering techniques, where we noticed that there is a lack of evaluation techniques regarding, uh, compared to the others. To solve this challenge, we then had two research axes that we will describe hereafter. In VR, the user will interact with a VR software application, and in order to navigate in the virtual environment, a locomotion techniques is required. As we've mentioned, the current perception action loop is modified and users provide inputs as action, as you can see here, to interact with the locomotion techniques and the VR software application will give a visual feedback to the user so that he can perceive his movement in the virtual environment. We now have an interaction between the user and the VR software application, meaning that the feedback provided by the VR system could be different from the feedback received in the real environment. And then the perception loop, action loop is modified. In this phase, we focus on how the impact of the locomotion techniques on this loop could be, and to investigate this impact, we had two research axes. The first one, here represented by the red arrow, is the influence of the locomotion techniques on user movement. That was rather focusing on user's action. The second one, represented by a, a green arrow, was how we could alter the perception of rotation gains in virtual environments, and we rather focus on users' perception. Locomotion techniques for navigating in virtual environments are a key component in virtual reality. Why walking remains the most ecological approach to explore virtual environments, it requires a large enough tracking area that is not available in most VR setups. Therefore, locomotion techniques can have two main requirements. First, we want to have unlimited and unconstrained locomotion in VR, and this can be achieved by either having a large enough workspace to track the users or using virtual techniques. Second, 
We would like to mimic natural walking in order to provide a similar perceptual feedback than in walking and minimize the potential impact of the locomotion techniques on users' behavior. To fulfill this requirement, different solutions have been developed in the literature. Taxonomies have been considered in order to classify and distinguish all the numerous techniques existing. In this PhD, we consider the taxonomy proposed by Lavira and colleagues that is based on users' physical movements. We then have either physical techniques that would require physical user's movement and virtual techniques that would require less or no physical movement, and those are the ones we focused in this thesis. Regarding physical techniques, we have, for instance, redirected walking, where users' physical motion is manipulated to enable users to remain in the workspace while exploring a larger virtual environment. It is also possible to use platforms to keep users in a limited space, and this platform consists in keeping the user in this limited space by compensating his movement. Other techniques require partial physical movements of the users where gestures are defined to, de to define the motion in the virtual environment. We can have either lower body gestures, such as in walking in place, where users step in place to explore this virtual environment, or we can also have uh, upper body gestures, such as in arm swinging, where the arms movement would enable this movement in the virtual environment. Physical techniques provide vestibular and propositive feedback while exploring the virtual environment, but they either require user of movements, large workspace, or expensive hardware interfaces. Then, to encounter these limitations, some virtual techniques have been considered. For example, we can have teleportation techniques that allow instantaneous displacement from one position to another by selecting this future direction. Uh, so, so position, sorry or steering techniques that enable users to control their virtual position and orientation by providing the direction, navigation direction to the system. As we mentioned in this PhD, we will focus on spatial steering techniques because they provide continuous virtual motion like in working in real environments without recovering physical motion. In steering techniques, three major components must be considered. The first one is the direction, meaning how the users can update its direction in the virtual environment and the direction is typically provided by either body segments, such as head or torso or hand, but you can also use a controller to define the direction. Second, input is, uh, second component is the input mechanism, referring to the conditions and input required to determine the navigation state, such as initiating the movement, continuing the movement, or stopping the movement. The last is the speed component, referring to how the speed is updated and can be uh, referred as the controller. We briefly reviewed the locomotion techniques used in VR. That was the focus in the first research axis, but steering techniques involve body rotation and then the perception of rotation could be also altered and we should consider this. That's why in the second axis, we focus on rotation gains that are a common technique used in VR. Those rotation gains are generally defined as the ratio between the amount of virtual and physical rotation performed. They are mostly used to amplify movement when physical motion is constrained. It means that either the amount of virtual or real rotation would be modified. One common example is during a 90 degree turn rotation, when if we have a gain equal to one, it means that both real and virtual rotations are the same. If the gain is more than one, for instance, two, then a 90 degree real rotation would result in a 180 degree virtual rotation. And if the, less, uh, the gain is less than one, for instance, 0 0.5, the real rotation is then amplified, and then to perform a 90 degree virtual rotation, users will have to perform a 180 real rotation. A lot of research has focused on how to assess the perception of these rotation gains, and one metric used to assess this perception of rotation gain is called detection threshold. Detection thresholds are the value that determines the gains at which users have hand person chance to detect or not rotation gains. Psychophysical experiments enable to gather data and then have psychometric curves that will determine the detection threshold, as you can see on the figure. In case of psychophysics studies, researchers are generally interested in the 25 and 75 percent detection thresholds that are the value at which people can, can have respectively 25 or 75 percent of chance to, de to detect a given stimulus. Researchers are also interested in the 50% detection threshold that is referred as the point of subjective equality. 
and it corresponds uh, to the threshold that is equally likely to be judged as higher or lower as a given stimulus. A lot of research work has focused on what could be the factors influencing those detection thresholds, and in particular by considering uh, motion uh, factors. Some results show that the amount of rotation, the field of view, and visual effects applied in the HMD could alter this perception of rotation gains. While the perception action loop is modified because of the locomotion techniques, there is also still an inner perception action loop performed by the users when he could also have real motion to move in the real environment while exploring this virtual environment. Therefore, it is necessary to have metrics that would measure the impact of the locomotion techniques on user experience. Variations of locomotion techniques allow to assess locomotion techniques in order to understand their impact on users' navigation in VR. In general, these variations focus on assessing variables either related, dependent to the locomotion techniques, such as how performant the technique can be, how it will maximize the presence or alter users' comfort by measuring cyber sickness, but also how the trajectories and users' motion could be altered by those techniques. Other variables are independent from this technique, such as the navigation task used to assess the technique, the type of virtual environment, or the VR system used. In our thesis, our approach was to consider human locomotion in real environments. It is then important to consider, uh, to consider the trajectories and the motions variables in the evaluations of locomotion techniques. Therefore, it can be interesting to consider properties of human walking while inst investigating locomotion in VR. Even though walking is the most used motion in daily life by humans, it still remains a sophisticated action. Walking can be considered as a cyclic action as each step, each step follows a similar pattern over time and can be decomposed into two phases, the swing phase and the stance phase. Besides, the head plays a major role in the walking gait. The head works as a stable inertial platform to control gaits and movement. Additional research works also demonstrating that body coordination during walking follow a specific pattern. In real environment, if a user walks along a curved trajectory, it has been demonstrated that the gaze anticipate the future direction followed by the other body segments such as the head, shoulders, torso, pelvis. This behavior is called top-down reorientation, where the gaze will always anticipate the future trajectory before the rest of the body, from the top to the bottom. Last, in terms of trajectories, research also demonstrated that we perform goal-directed locomotion tasks in a similar manner. It means that if you ask users to start from a given position and orientation and end at a given position and orientation, Walkers would uh, walk in a similar manner and in terms of trajectory and uh, tangential speed profile. To sum up, regarding this related work, there exist many solutions to navigate in virtual environments, but we notice that there are few work regarding the impact of locomotion techniques on human motor control. Thus, thanks to this multidisciplinary approach we are following, we consider knowledge from human locomotion in real environment to understand human behavior in virtual environments. And our approach was to find metrics adapted to low-man locomotions in VR. In order to understand the impact of the locomotion techniques on users' perception and action, we focused on two different axes, research axes that we described before. The first one was the influence of the locomotion techniques on users' movement, and the second one, how we could alter the perception of rotation gains in virtual environment. Thus, we identified factors represented by diamonds on the figures and metrics to assess the factors represented by overs related to users' behavior. Overall, we did five contributions investigated how fact these factors related to the locomotion techniques could influence the perception action loop. Each contribution are either related to the first, and, uh, first or second research axis, and now we will describe the first research axis contribution that is, the influence of the locomotion techniques on users' movement. So, in the first contribution, we're investigating the influence of the heading update on gaze behavior, and to assess this factor, we use the metrics of gaze behavior and body coordination. Our motivation for this study was to understand how, how human control 
their movement in VR, and more precisely, how the gaze anticipation is in VR. We presented before how the gaze anticipation works in real environment, but only few works assess this gaze anticipation in VR, and that was only for 90 degree turns we're using only walking. Thus, we have no information regarding gaze anticipation for curvilinear trajectories and also no information about how other locomotion techniques could alter or not gaze behavior. Then, our research questions for these contributions were, are gaze anticipation and top-down reorientation preserved in VR during curvilinear trajectories? And also, do locomotion techniques influence those properties? To answer these questions, we first conducted uh, a studies where participants had to perform a H-shaped trajectory with different locomotion techniques. We tested five techniques, including rear walking, three steering techniques with either using the head, the torso, or the hand uh, to define the direction, and also a passive techniques where the virtual motion was automatically updated. We had 20 participants and we gathered motion data such as the gaze, head, and shoulders position and orientation in both virtual and in rear environment. <coughs> For the steering techniques, we designed a control law that is adapted to the task and that is based on the biomechanics of walking that use a, a one-third power law. It, is it has been proven in rear environment that during curved trajectories, the speed depends on the local radius of the curvature, namely r in the equation, and a speed gain coefficient uh, referred as k. The radius of the trajectory curvature is the radius of the circle that best fits at user's position. So we were able to adapt user speed depending on the curvature of the trajectories during the height shape. Here on this slide, you can see the experimental task for two conditions. On the top, you have the walking condition where users were performing the height shape in the virtual environment by performing the height shape in, uh, in working in the rear environment. On the bottom, you have the hand steering conditions in which users provided the future direction with the controller orientation. To assess body segments temporal orientation, we analyzed horizontal angles of the body segments, such as the gaze, the head, and the shoulders, and the headed direction. And to compare the anticipation between those body segments, we computed cross-correlation between those angles. Regarding the results, we notice first that gaze anticipation is preserved during navigation in virtual environment for the walking condition. Here on this figure, you have the average uh, temporal evolution of each body segment, where you have the gaze in green, the head in orange, the shoulders in purple, and the heading direction in blue. We can see that the gaze in green and the head in shoulders are anticipating the future trajectory that is re represented by the blue curve, meaning that the horizontal angles of gaze and head will always decrease or increase before the heading direction. Moreover, we compare this anticipation between the different locomotion techniques. And we showed that virtual techniques generate different anticipation mechanism than walking. Here, the figure shows the temporal anticipation in milliseconds of the gaze in gray and the head in blue with respect to the heading direction. We see that the delays decrease from walking to passive, and in particular, postdoc comparison showed that there is a higher anticipation of gaze and head for walking and torso steering compared to the three others virtual techniques. These results are important because they show how, the, how impactful could be the locomotion techniques on human users' movement, depending on the steering techniques used. To sum up this contribution, we assessed for the first time gaze anticipation during curvilinear trajectories in VR with different locomotion techniques. The results contribute to the understanding of human body coordination in VR, and it's also shown that it is possible to consider human locomotion laws to improve locomotion techniques in VR. In this experiment, we designed a control law adapted to the task that relied on the one-third power law, where we were decreasing the speed depending on the trajectory's curvature. However, we have no information about its potential impact on users' navigation, and that's why we decided in a second contribution to investigate this control law and, in general, the impact of control law uh, of the speed update on users' body coordination. Sorry. As we mentioned in the related work section, steering techniques has three major components, the direction, the input, and the speed. In this contribution, we focus on the speed component hereafter referred as the control law, 
because we noticed that most of the research work focus on either the evaluation of the direction input uh, component or the input component where the influence of head rotations or different inputs were assessed. But we have no really information about how the speed could alter users' navigation. That's why our research question for this contribution was, what is the influence of the controller on trajectories and users' preferences? To answer these questions, we conducted an experiment where the objective was to analyze spatial temporal features of trajectories during a virtual slalom. We chose a slalom task as it involves curvilinear trajectories and change of direction. We used a torso technique based, based, a torso technique based on the previous results where we noticed that torso steering generated closer anticipation behavior than the other virtual steering techniques. We then had two within subject variables, where first we varied the type of the controller speed update by even having a constant speed, a linear speed depending on user's input, and an adaptive controller that was the power law that we described in the previous contribution. We also had three types of slalom curvature, where we had either high curvature, medium curvature, or low curvature. We had 18 participants for this study, and we recorded body segments and motion data, such as head and shoulders position and orientation, but also subjective data, such as the NASA TEDx questionnaire to assess cognitive demand of those control loops. Regarding the results, we first, noti we first noticed a similarity of trajectories across the control loops. The left figure here shows the average virtual path followed by each uh, by participants for each controller for a given curvature, here the high one. You can see a great similarity regarding the path followed for a given curvature across these control rows, meaning that participants perform the slalom task in terms of trajectories with the same manner regardless the control rows. We also showed an effect of the control rows and curvatures on users' angular speed profiles. If you look at this figure, it represents the average angular speed profile performed by users during a turn in the slalom. And in particular, we reported lower uh, angular profile for the adaptive technique that is in green compared to the constant and linear, that is blue and uh, red curves. Last, we reported an effect of NASA TEDx scores on the effort and physical scares where you can notice that on the box plots, the scores for the adaptive law are lower than for the constant and linear one, meaning that they were feeling less effort using the adaptive techniques compared to the others. To sum up, in this contribution, we assess the impact of controllers and trajectory curvatures on users' movement. The results contribute to the improvements of tiering laws for navigating in VR, and one takeaway message for this contribution is that we recommend using adaptive uh, control laws when high virtual turns are involved in the trajectories. In addition to these results, during the study, we noticed something that we did not expect. While users were performing the slalom with the steering techniques that should not require physical translation, we noticed that the user may drift when performing rotations. And this risk was unexpected, and that's why we wanted to assess it in the third contribution, where we in investigated the impact of the speed update and steering techniques on unintended positional drift. Unintended positional drift, or UPD, is a phenomenon that was first reported by Nissan and colleagues during walking in place. As you can see on the video, the repetitions of movements and the discrepancy between physical and virtual motion could induce some drift where users shift from the center of the workspace. UPD can be problematic as it decreases user safety that could reach and hit the boundaries of the workspace, but also recent study shows that task performance where high UPD increased time to perform the navigation task. Then, our motivation for this research work was to investigate UPD during steering navigation, and we wondered whether UPD can occur while using steering techniques to navigate in VR. To answer this question, or to, yeah, to follow this question, we considered the following methodology. First, we collected some locomotion data, and we used the data set from the previous contribution with the slalom task. Then we analyzed this data to answer the following research question. Does UPD occur during a repetitive steering navigation task? To perform analysis of UPD, we consider the analysis in both virtual and real environment. 
We define the UPD as the physical displacement of users in the real environment, where we computed users' position in the workspace as the barycenters of users' shoulders, as you can see on the bottom figure. We also computed the user's amplitude, that is, the amount of user's rotation across time, as you can see on the top figure. We separated the virtual trajectories into virtual turns that are a portion of the salon between two inflection points. Last, we consider the UPD on both axes of the user's workspace. The first one was the mediolateral axis, ML, that corresponds to leftwards and rightwards drift. But we also have analysis on the AP axis, the anteroposterior, when we have forward and, forward and backward drift. But in this presentation, we will only focus on the ML axis because this is where we get the most significant results. Regarding the analysis of UPD, we computed the difference of user's position in the workspace between the start and the end of the virtual turn. You can see on this figure the density map of user's position after a left turn or a right turn. We can notice that there is some UPD towards the direction of the turn on the ML axis, which is represented by the red arrow. This means that users were either shifting leftwards during a left turn or rightwards during a, a right turn. This observation was statistically confirmed and an average user shift about 20 centimeters after a turn. Thanks to this analysis, we tried to create some UPD model and answer the second research question. Is it possible to quantify and model UPD for a given navigation task? Based on the analysis we, we did, we considered two different models. The first one was a linear regression describing the relation between UPD and user's amplitude. And for each user, we estimated the, slope, uh, uh, the intercept and the slope. The second one was based on Gaussian mixture model that are probabilistic models uh, based on Gaussian distributions. We computed uh, for each user the center of ellipse and covariance metrics. With these models, we were able to simulate new data and with a simulation-based uh, evaluation, we wonder whether we could assess UPD through simulation-based experiment or not. To perform the simulation, we followed the same methodology used in simulation to assess redirected walking controller. On the video, you can see an example of the simulated task thanks to our simulation frameworks in which we have two agents, one purple agent represented by the, uh, the purple color, and one real agent uh, represented in white. The purple agent on the bottom is performing the virtual slalom while the white agent is rotating with the steering techniques and also drifting in the workspace, as you can see, uh, the, the workspace is represented by the red plane. We simulated the slalom task and added the, the UPD models, and we were able to gather and collect simulated data that we wanted to compare with the ground truth uh, with our uh, real data. Regarding the results of the simulation, we used the same analyzed pipeline to estimate UPD models from the simulated data. And we showed that there is no statistical comparison. Uh, the statistical comparison showed that there is no significant difference between real and simulated data on UPD on the ML axis. This suggests that the use of simulation-based experiment uh, evaluations could be feasible and would allow to the repetition of multiple simulation while modifying the models. To sum up, we made a first characterization of UPD during locomotion while using steering techniques in VR, and our results provide new perspective about the understanding of UPD during navigation in VR. It also provides new potential application regarding the designs of locomotion techniques where the UPD could be taken into account. To sum up the contributions done in the first axis, we showed that some factors related to the locomotion techniques, such as the heading and speed update, could affect users' movement. And in particular, the, we demonstrate this influence thanks to metrics such as the gaze behavior, body coordination, or UPD. We will now cover the research we did on the second axis that was altering the perception of rotation gains in virtual environment. In this axis, we focus on users' perception of rotations while using rotation gains with a strong focus on visual perception. First, we focused on the influence of vignetting on the perception of rotation gains. Vignetting is a technique used in VR to restrict users' field of view by applying visual effect in the peripheral region. 
As you can see on the videos, the vision is restricting some to FX, and there exist several models in the literature where the input to determine the amount of restriction can be either based on controller input or uh, motion uh, input such as head movements or ocular activity. The main advantage of using vignetting is that it can decrease cyber sickness, but it can also decrease performance in the meantime. Little is known regarding the influence of vignetting on perception of rotation gains, and then our research question for this experiment was, can dynamic vignetting alter the perception of rotation gains? Indeed, few works have focused on this factor, and the main studies only used the static vignetting, meaning that the restricted vision was always the same during the whole rotation. We assume that the use of a dynamic vignetting could be more subtle than a static vignetting, and it could uh, decreasing steer the user sensitivity to rotation gains. Then, to investigate this result question, we conducted an experiment where we assess the perception of rotation gains while applying vignetting during 60 and 90 degree turns. We used different type of vignetting by either varying the shape of the uh, restriction by either using horizontal restriction or global, which is circular restriction. But we also vary the effect applied on this restriction by either applying, uh, by decreasing the luminance and applying a black texture or using a blur effect based on the Gaussian blur to blur the peripheral region. Here on this video, you can see the four conditions that we use where the first one on the top left was the global luminance, the second on the top right was the blur, uh, global blur, the third one on the bottom left was the horizontal luminance, and the fourth one was the horizontal blur on the bottom right. We won't go into much detail regarding this contribution, but the main result in this study we found is that we noticed an effect of vignetting type on the PSE and detection thresholds where users were slight, slightly less sensitive to rotation gains with the global vignetting than the baseline with vignetting. However, we did not notice an effect of the amount of rotation to perform or the effect applied on the PSE and detection threshold. Then to explain these results, we assume that other factors could be involved in the perception of rotation gains that we did not consider in this study, such as the optical flow, the gaze activity, but also the proprioception. That's why we conducted a second study in which we considered the user's motion as a factor in the perception of these rotation gains. The motivation of the study was like, most of the studies that assess perception of rotation gains the users could rotate at their desired space, meaning that little is known about the influence of the rotational speed on the perception of rotation gains. Moreover, as you can see on this video, the whole body rotation does not induce any virtual translation in the virtual environment, and then we wonder whether the use of virtual translation could modify or not the perception of rotation gains. That's why our research questions for this contribution were, can the rotational and or the combination of rotational and translation speed alter the perception of rotation gains in VR? But also, are gaze and body segments movement altered by rotation gains? To investigate these research questions, we conducted a user study where we used a similar protocol than the previous experiment. Participants had to perform rotation by aligning themselves with the virtual sphere in the virtual environment, and each rotation lasted three seconds at a constant rotational speed. They had to answer the following questions. I felt that my virtual rotation speed was either faster or slower than my real one. They were answering faster if the gain more than one was applied and slower if they think that a gain slower than one was applied. We had two within subject variables in which first we varied the translation, virtual translational speed by either applying no virtual translation as you can see on the top video or on the second condition, the T conditions, applying a constant 1.4 meter per second virtual translation during the rotation. We also varied the rotational speed and where users were either rotating at 20, 30, or 40 degrees per second. We tested six gains from 0 0.5 to 1.5 with a 0 0.2 step. We had four in participants for this study, and we gathered the answers uh, from the one AFC questions, as well as some motion data, such as gaze, head, and truck position and orientation in both real and virtual environments. Regarding the results, 
We fit psychometric functions from the one IFC answers, and we were able to compute the detection thresholds and the PSC. As you can see uh, on the following table, those are the detection thresholds and PSC computed for the 20 and 30 and 40 uh, rotational speed. The main result is that we noticed lower PSC and detection thresholds for the 40 degrees per second conditions compared to 20 and 30, meaning that users were more sensitive to rotation gains at higher rotational speed. However, we did not notice an effect uh, of the translational, virtual translation speed on the perception of rotation gains, meaning that adding virtual translation did not modify the perception of rotation gain. Regarding the gaze data, we noticed several results, including first, virtual translation made easier spheres fixation. On the left figure, we can see the heat map of gaze fixation, uh, where the sphere was located at the zero, zero coordinate. For on the bottom, you have when translation is applied, and on the top, when no translation is applied. We can see that the density of the gaze is uh, more towards the center when virtual translation is applied, meaning that virtual motion helped users to better gaze at the sphere. Moreover, the gain and rotational speed uh, had an impact on gaze dispersion and patterns, where for each user, we were able to fit an ellipse of the points of the data points uh, for each trial. And we noticed that for the highest gains, 1.5, the ellipse width was civic significantly higher than all the other gains used, meaning that the gaze pattern were more spread when this game was applied, but also that by increasing uh, the rotational speed, this would also lead to higher spread of the gaze during the trial. To sum up, we assess the impact of both translational and rotational speed on the perception of rotation gains. The main message of this contribution are that users are more sensitive to rotation gains at higher rotational speed, but also that the gaze behavior could be modified by the rotation gains. To sum up the contributions done on the second research axis, we showed new results regarding factors that could influence the perception of rotation gains. A peripheral vignetting could decrease the sensitivity of, uh, of amplified rotations, and the rotation of speed can also uh, alter the perception of rotation gains. Besides, we provided new ethics that could help to understand the perception of rotation gains regarding body segment coordination and gaze behavior. To sum up all the contribution together, in this thesis, we aimed at investigating the impact of locomotion techniques on users' perception and action. We followed the multidisciplinary approach where we focus on two research axes focusing on users' perception and action. We showed that users' behavior can be altered by factors from the locomotion techniques. In particular, the heading update or the speed update can alter users' movements and behavior, such as the gaze, anticipation, or the body coordination. But we also noticed that steering techniques could provide drift. Factors more related to vision and perception of rotation, such as rotation gains and vignetting, can modify this perception of rotations. But also that users' real motion, and in particular the pace that they are rotating when a gain is applied, could alter this perception of rotation gains. Altogether, the research work presented in the thesis contributes to the understanding of how some factors alter user perception and action while navigating in VR. However, future work is still required to improve the design of locomotion techniques. And regarding the short-term per perspective of this thesis, if we focus on the first contribution, we should investigate more gates and users' movement during steering locomotions. For instance, we should assess different locomotion tasks that would better a fit to ecological tasks, I mean, having, assessing more ecological tasks that would uh, be uh, more rare because we only did an H-shaped trajectory. It would be also interesting to have a deeper analysis of how the impact of translation on biomechanics at, is had been done on redirected walking. Regarding the second contribution, we should extend the studies regarding the impact of steering control rows. For example, it would be interesting to estimate or having information about what could be the threshold values of steering parameters, such as the translational speed or the rotational speed, but also having a better understanding on how steering techniques could influence users' precision performance or cognitive load. 
Regarding the third contribution on UPD, we should assess other locomotion tasks and factors to have a better understanding of UPD. Also, it could be done by improving the simulator and exploring more UPD models, such as machine learning-based models. Regarding the second axis, one objective would be to improve redirection techniques that use rotation gains. To do this, we argue that considering user's motion would be an important factor when using rotation gains, but also that the gaze and body behavior could be promising metrics to create new type of gains as it has already done, where, for example, saccades or blink can be used during redirected walking. Regarding our experiments, we should investigate more vignetting factors, like, for instance, considering the gaze activity in our vignetting model to improve it. But also assessing different types of, uh, uh, of gains. In our experiments, we apply the gain constantly, but some studies showed that adaptive gain and different implementation of rotation gains could also alter, alter the perception of rotation gains. The results gathered during this PhD could enable the designs of new locomotion techniques. And for instance, we started to imagine and, and to, yeah, to consider a technique that we could call redirected steering that is inspired from redirected walking. You can see on the left picture a normal day at work and myself using a PhD, uh, a PhD a HMD in our very small workspace in my lab office. As you can see, I'm navigating with the steering techniques, but I am very close to the wall and I'm now aware about it because I had some UPD while navigating. And if I do one more step forward, I will just hit the wall. Then the objective of redirected steering would be to optimize UPD so that I would never reach the boundaries of the workspace unconsciously. And this could be done uh, by recentering myself or recentering the users that he would face the, the center of the workspace represented by a, a red cross by applying rotation gains. One approach we first imagined would be to reorient the users to the centers by applying gains. And for instance, here, I should do a half turn to face the center of the workspace. And then if I apply a gain, I will have to do more physical rotation than in the virtual environment to reach my next destination. And then I could face the center of the workspace without even realizing it, noticing it. This technique is still a prototype and future work should be required to design and assess it. Regarding long-term perspective of this PhD, the constraint of locomotion in VR are still not solved and some additional work has to be considered. First, it is important to remind that understanding human locomotion in VR is a multifactorial problem to solve. And unfortunately, we, when we are designing a, a locomotion evaluation, we focus on one factor and it's hard to understand the interaction. The objective we would have to make a locomotion interface that would be transparent to the users, but we all know that there still not exist a perfect locomotion techniques and we should also have techniques adapted either to the task or the environment. <laughs> One approach to reach this perfect technique that would be transparent to the user would be, could be to minimize the influence of the locomotion techniques on users' perception and action loop. And three guidelines could be considered, such as improving the variations of locomotion techniques, also considering more the task and the virtual environments as independent factors in our studies and uh, st uh, investigating more and more body segments and body related metrics based on human motion. Here you can see a list of the contribution done and presenting during this studies. And we had two international collaborations. The first one was with Gerd Brüder from the University of Central Florida and another one done with Jana Podkosova and Anes Kaufmann from the Technical University of Vienna. Thank you for your attention.